Well, we are currently in this series, What Do You Do? What do you do? And uh, it's been following the book of James. That's going to be the primary text. And, and our passage today comes from James chapter 2, the second half of the passage. And uh, I want to encourage you to uh, get your Bibles and to follow along. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in front of you. Thank you, Fern, for purchasing those years ago. Um, we really appreciate that. Uh, so James chapter 2 and verse number 14 says this, What good is it, my brother? So he's talking to believers. Is it a specific church? Well, we don't know. But, uh, you know, it very well could be the church at Jerusalem that, he, that he's the bishop over, the pastor over, the overseer. But he says, what good is it, my brothers? So he's going to talk to believers, not, not heathens. Uh, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister. So he says, believers, let's talk about fellow believers. All right? He's going to throw some examples in here. He says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. <clears throat> if one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and, and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Awesome. That's, that's awesome. Even the devils believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac? Now we, we say Isaac, it's, it, it's Yitzhak, Yitzhak, it's Avrahim, it's Yaakov, it's, uh, you know, we, we, we say these funny pronunciations, but, you know, that just popped in my mind here. Um, when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. Now again, James is just really drilling down that a genuine faith will have deeds. Intentional deeds. Intentional deeds. <clears throat> And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. I'm going to be talking about talking the talk, walking the walk, you know, all right? You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So today, today, what do you do when beliefs and actions don't match, all right? What do you do in those situations? Well, we have to make a course adjustment is what we do, all right? You know, when, when, when we read something in the Word of God and we realize, oh, snap, I'm not doing that. All right, we need to begin doing that. It's it, it just that simple. We need to make a, a course change in our lives whether that's starting something or stopping something, doing something, not doing something, whatever it might be. When, when our lives don't match up with the Word of God, we need to make a course direction, correction. So when beliefs and actions don't meet, right? So uh, SMU, Southern, Me Southern Methodist University, in 1920 did a survey of religious practices, all right? Here's what they found. 90% of the people questioned said that they truly believed in God. Well, that's awesome. I like that. I like to hear that stat. Wow, isn't that something? However, now this is a 2020 survey, 
SMU did this. However, only 32% believe their faith had anything to do with their daily activities. <laughs> like, what? What? Are you kidding me? You, you believe in God. 90% of you do. But only a third of you believe your faith should have anything to do with your daily life. What? Uh, 50% of those surveyed haven't been to a religious service for three months. <laughs> yeah, not good. 33% haven't been to a religious service for more than a year. All right, not good. Only 10% believe all of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> I mean, one in ten. And 40% only believe in five or fewer. <laughs> and these, these are Christians. So Chuck Colson, the late, great Chuck Colson, what a brilliant man he was. Uh, you, you just can't casually read books by Chuck Colson. He, he's a real thinker. And when you read books by Chuck Colson, yeah, you know. So here's what Chuck Colson said, all right? He said, spiritual consumers... And there's a lot of spiritual consumers in our culture today. And there's churches who say we're user-friendly. We will never, ever say it because we don't believe in users. <laughs> you know, we're not going to be users. We're not going to be takers. You know? But here's what Chuck, Chuck Colson said. Spiritual consumers aren't interested in what the church stands for. Their interest is in the personal fulfillment that can be delivered. Does it make me feel good? This results in a mixum, matchum, salad bar spirituality that produces minimal growth and maximum ineffectiveness. Ouch. Wow, but that, that's really true. You know, so in the passage that we just read, faith and works is mentioned ten different times. Ten times in that passage. And simply stated, we can't have the one without the other. You know, one person says, oh, I've got great faith. Another person says, well, I've got all these works. I'm, I'm doing good. All right? You have to have both. Either we have a genuine faith with accompanying works, or we don't. And again, if we don't, guess what? We need to make a course correction. So that we're not found lacking on the day that we stand before God. So that we're not found wanting. And so James counters three really untruths of his day um, that were prevalent. And, and so he countered these. So I'm, I'm going to give you three of these here this morning that James mentions in this second half of the second chapter of James. And there's just five chapters in James. But he's going to counter three untruths, all right? Here's the first one. Real faith is more than talking the talk, all right? Real faith, a genuine faith is more than just blabbing it, you know, just declaring, oh, I love Jesus. You know, we've all met people, and we've all known people, maybe for a long time, and then they say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian, and you're, and you're kind of like, wow, fantastic, and you're thinking in your heart, I, I had no clue that that was the case, <laughs> all right? Right, you know? And so real faith is more than just talking the talk. I'm going to show you a picture. Who knows who this picture is? Larry Bird, the hick from French Lick. Right? Larry Bird grew up in a very small community in, in Indiana called French Lick. And uh, Larry Bird was one of the greatest players ever to lace up the sneakers. But you'll notice that Larry Bird... Um, there, there's something very distinguishing about Larry Bird. A couple of different things. One, he's white. He's white. And yet he's considered to be one of the greatest players ever. And note something about Larry Bird's arms. There, there's no definition on Larry Bird's arms. You see a black ball player, they're ripped. Man, they're, they're looking fine. I mean, they, they are ripped. And if you were to watch Larry Bird play, you would notice that he was slow, and he couldn't jump. It's really true. White men can't jump. <laughs> and yet Larry Bird was one of the greatest players ever. And one of the things that made that, that is famous about Larry Bird, if you ask any ball player that he played with, the Michael Jordans, the Scottie Pippins, the Magic Johnson, Isaiah Thomas, Kareem Jabbar, you ask any of the players in the NBA who played with the hick from French Lick, and they're going to say, 
who's the greatest trash talker in the NBA? And every one of them will say, hands down, Larry Bird. Larry Bird was a trash talker. He called them chumps and losers, and he had a, he kind of had a foul mouth, and he used some words I won't use. And uh, Larry Bird was a trash talker, but also he backed up his trash talking. Again, you, you listen to these interviews about Larry Bird, and they'll all tell you stories about how, you know, they, they'd come out of a huddle, and it's the last play of the game. And Larry would say, I'm going to go over to that corner, the ball is going to be passed first to this person, then it's going to give to me, and I'm going to sink the three-pointer, there's nothing you can do about it. And they come out of the huddle, it passes this one person, it's given to Larry Bird, and he, and he sinks the shot. He says, I'm going to go over here and I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to burn you on this play. And they wouldn't be able to stop him. He was unstoppable. He was a trash talker. But you know the thing about Larry is he backed it up. He didn't just simply talk a good game. He backed it up. And he was an unstoppable player. And if it weren't for the fact that he had some pretty severe injuries, what he could have done. Now, he still is considered to be one of the best ball players to ever play in the game. But the point I'm trying to make about Larry, he didn't just simply talk the talk, he backed it up. And we as believers, we just can't simply talk the talk. I'm a Christian, praise the Lord. You know, we have to have more than that. And so I'm going to give to you three sub points on this, on this very first point here. Talking a good game doesn't save us. Now, this is according to James. I'm going away from the NBA now, and I'm going back to the Word of God. Talking a good game doesn't save us. So I'm going to give to you two verses here that are the identical verses. What good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? All right? Same exact verse, but now it's going to be a different translation. And it says this, if a man says that he has faith, and it's not demonstrated through his works, can that... And I highlighted that word. Can that kind of faith save him? You talk a good talk, but James says that, that won't save you. If you don't back up, can that kind of faith save you? And the answer, it, 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 it just understood to be no. He says, can that kind, you talk a good game, but that kind of faith won't save you. Talking a good game doesn't save us. Again, James declares that simply professing faith won't save us. Secondly, right, this, these are some sub-points from, from James. Talking a good game, you know, talking smack, trash talker. You know, you, you can say the lingo, all right? Talking a good game won't produce service. James says this in verses 15 and 16. Actually, it says 15 and 15. No, it should be 15 and 16. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? What good is it? If you're not serving, what good is your profession? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Talking a good game is not going to produce service and compassion and kindness to humanity. And we're called to do that. All right? Write this down. Take a picture. The Holy Spirit dropped in my heart. Our faith expressions, you know, our talk, our talk, must be confirmed by our lifestyle actions, our walk. We need to talk the talk and we need to walk the walk. All right? They must be accompanied. Now, I don't know who this author is, but he, he paraphrased Matthew where, where Jesus says, and I was in prison and you came to visit me. I was, I was hungry, you fed me. I was naked, you clothed me. Right? This, this author, he paraphrases this in a very cynical way. And, it, and it's to emphasize this point that talking a good game doesn't produce service. So here's what this author says. I was hungry and you formed a humanities club to discuss my hunger. I was in prison, and you went to your chapel to, to pray for my release. I was naked, and in your mind you debated the morality of my appearance. I was sick, and you knelt and thanked God for your own health. I was homeless, and you preached to me how the love of God is a spiritual house. I was lonely, and you left me alone to pray for me. 
you know, our talk has to have service to it. If we name the name of Christ, we need to show it. We need to show it. So James declares that simply professing faith without genuine works isn't genuine. It just isn't genuine. We need to actually serve people. Thirdly, thirdly, again, real faith is more than talking the talk, right? Here's the third point under that. Talking a good game is not going to last. It's just not going to last. James says this, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. It's just not going to endure. Literally, the works that we do are going to provide a fuel for us. All right? So James implies that deeds and actions will literally bring life to us. It, it'll make us more healthy so that our words aren't empty. All right? And again, if we have one without the other, he says our faith will die. Listen to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. The Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Jesus says this, you will know them by their fruits, what they do. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit, in other words, doesn't have actions to back it up. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by your fruits, by your actions, will you know them. So James says this, again, same, same passage, two different translations. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. Money. You said you have faith, no deeds, I'm not, I'm not doing I'm not demonstrating it. And he says, I'm going to show you my faith by my deeds. Same verse, same verse, this is the different translation, the New American Standard Bible. He says, you have faith and I have works. I can demonstrate my faith by my works, but I challenge you to exhibit your faith without works. Ooh, wow. So again, are, are, are we getting the picture here that talking the talk isn't good enough. Our world wants to see it. It's been said that our world doesn't want to know, uh, let's see, how, how do we phrase, um, our, our world doesn't want, uh, our world doesn't, hmm, I'll butcher it if I, there, there, there's a great phrase. There you go. Our world does not want to know how much we care. They want to know <laughs> there we go. I wish, I wish John had a microphone. For, but it really is true. They want to see the actions in our lives. That we don't just simply talk. All right. So real faith is more than talking the talk. Number two. Then I just have three of these. Real faith, and this is according to James, real faith is more than just mental assent. Yeah. Just, yeah, okay, yeah. That, that's awesome. That's good. Again, praise the Lord, hallelujah, you know. Right? It's, it's more than mental assent. So we follow along in James chapter 2. He says, you believe, you give assent. You, you believe that there is one God. That's fantastic, good, awesome. He says, even the demons believe that and shudder, all right? <laughs> so there is spiritual belief that's just purely head knowledge. And we know people like this. It doesn't mean that we're throwing stones at them. It's just, there, 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 there should be something more than just naming the name of Christ. There should be some meatiness to our lives, all right? So just having head knowledge, well, we know that. Yep, we, we, we know that. But James says that even demons have faith. They, they believe, right? James 2.19, you believe that there is one God? Even the demons believe. They have a faith. But that faith, the Bible says, causes them to shudder. In other words, they have actions to their faith. How about that? The devils have a faith. And they have such a faith that they actually put actions to it. And wouldn't that be a sad commentary that we are outdone by demons? <laughs> like, wow, 
That'd be sad. All right? So this is why James was so bent out, or excuse me, why Jesus was so bent out of shape with the Pharisees and Sadducees. You know, they had these special robes with these special ornaments on them. They hung things from their head. You know, they would hang down their little boxes. They're called cycletaries. And they had scripture verses on the inside, you know. And, and, and when people saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it was almost like, yeah, there they are. And they had always the best seats. And, and Jesus was bent out of shape over them. All right? Listen to what he says in Matthew 23. You must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not copy what they do, for they don't practice what they preach. They don't practice what they preach. It's more than mental assent. Everything they do is for show. Oh, they, 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 they know the scriptures. The Pharisees memorized the first five books of the Bible. Like, what? They knew it. They gave mental assent. And then this prophet arrives. This prophet who's preaching a message that's never been heard before. And suddenly these religious people want to kill him. Last I checked, religion and killing don't work well together. You know? And Jesus just cracked on them. He says, they don't practice what they preach. Listen to what he says a little bit further down in Matthew 23. They're, they're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from their herb gardens but they ignore the more important aspects of the law, you know, justice and mercy. They're like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. They, they give mental assent, but they are wicked to the core. And then listen to the final condemnation that Jesus has in this 23rd chapter. He says, you snakes, <laughs> you brood of vipers, you know, exclamation points. How will you escape being condemned to hell? <laughs> I mean, everyone say wowzers. Like, wow, you talk about strong. Imagine if I would get up on a Sunday morning and start reaming you out and say, you're going to be condemned to hell. Man, the, the, there, there would just be a wind blowing behind from all the people that would be running out the doors. I mean, but Jesus just told it like it was. You give mental assent, and there is nothing about your life that shows the reality of this. In fact, we shouldn't try and imitate you because you're just a bunch of snakes. So we have to have more than mental assent. What are we doing? All right? What are we doing? doing to really prove our faith. And there's just, there's practical ways. Are we putting a shopping cart away for someone in the parking lot? Are we maybe paying for the McDonald's order? And if you do, give them a, a Bethel card too, right? You know, there's, there's, there's ways of doing this. You, you can pay for a McDonald's order. You can babysit your neighbor's children. Something has come up, they can't get a babysitter. Yeah, I'll, 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 look after, I'll look after your kids. How about, you know, we're coming up on snow, shoveling your neighbor's driveway or sidewalks, or bringing a coworker home from a little minor surgery that they had. They can't drive. They need someone to bring them home from the surgery. You know, practical ways, not just having mental assent, but practical ways. Again, real faith is more than talking the talk. Real faith is more than mental assent. And then thirdly here, the last point, and I'm doing fantastic this morning. <laughs> Show me some love. <laughs> Thank you for those two. <laughs> oh, you know, in a black church, all you'd have to say is Jesus is Lord. And it would just be thunderous. Just, just, yeah! They'd be waving hankies and you know, <laughs> and, and we're the frozen chosen up here. You know, I remember one time, I remember one time, uh, some, some people came to the church for a concert, and, and they commented afterwards when we were giving them their check, what a dead church. 
yeah, I know. I just, and, and here's the thing. And they were from the deep south. And, um, you know, up here in the great white north, you're, you're Norwegian, you're Swedish, you're a Finlander, you're a German. We are the frozen chosen up here. Those, those ethnicities don't show a lot of enthusiasm. You know, when there's a hilarious joke, the frozen chosen will do this. That's about the best you'll get out of them. You'll just barely get a little smirk out of them. But you know what I said to them? What I said to them is when, and, and you know, everyone up here is either a Catholic or a Lutheran. You know, there's no Church of God up here in Wisconsin, basically. You know, they're all down south. But I said, you know, when the, the Swedes and the Finns and the Norwegians and the Germans and the Poles get saved? Well, they get saved. And they're with you. They're with you. know, so I, I, I never need to have a, a slap on the back or a hand clap or, you know, really honestly, truly, because I know you're with me. It, it, it may not be shown in all kinds of crazy enthusiasm, but I know you're with me. You know, all right? So lastly, number three, number three, real faith is more than a good time. <laughs> you know, it, it's more than your best life now. And I've read that book. And I believe that. And I, and I believe there's tremendous truth in that. But it's more than just your best life now. It's more than what's in it for me. You know, like Chuck Colson talked about this consumer mentality. It's more than the Holy Spirit goosebumps. Well, I didn't feel the Holy Spirit today. Well, it's more than the Holy Spirit goosebumps. It's really where the rubber meets the road. And it's our profession lived out. You know, many of you have gone through really hard times. And you show your real faith by living it out in the midst of. In the midst of. And James says this, we're coming to the close of the chapter here, in verses 21 through 24. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did? when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. By what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. By what we do. Again, not just talking the talk or even trash talking. You know, you're such a wonderful Christian. All right? It's more than just giving mental assent. Yeah, yeah, I believe that. But what are we doing? And James says that Abraham was considered righteous by what he did and not by faith alone. All right? So let's look at that scenario. Let's go to Genesis as to what actually happened. Genesis 22 and 9. When they reached the place God had told them about, and this was a three-day journey, all right? That's a long time to rethink what God is asking you to do. And by the way, what is God asking Abraham to do? To sacrifice his son. And at a certain point, Isaac says, uh, Dad, uh, see the wood? I see the altar. Where's the, where's the sacrifice? <laughs> You're up, son. <laughs> you know, so he had three days to rethink this. He had been asking God for two and a half decades for a son. At a certain point, he took, he took things into his own hands and sired a, he sired a son, Ishmael. But he had been waiting for about 25 years for the promise of God to come to pass. Finally, he gets his son. How old is Isaac here? We aren't exactly sure. People have you know, speculated on this. But God says, sacrifice the one that I gave to you in answer to your prayers. And he had three days to rethink this. 
He had, he had, he had 72 hours to think this over, all right? Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to... How many of us could do that? None of us could do that. But Abraham did, and that's why he's called the father of the faithful. He had time to reconsider this. But he didn't. He did what God told him to do. It wasn't mental assent. It wasn't a good time. I hope parents don't ask this of their children. Did you have a fun time at church today? It isn't about fun times. Kids, teachers. No, we're teach and, I, and I'll say this. My goodness. What the teachers teach the children at Bethel is breathtaking. Just walk downstairs and just look what's on the walls. It's not all a bunch of games and fun activities, though they do do those things in spades. They are being taught deep truths of the Bible. Deep truths of the Bible. They're not just over there having a fun time. Did you have a fun time? What you should say, what was the lesson today? What did Miss Carrie teach you today? What did Miss Hannah teach you today? What did Mr. Al teach you today? You know? It was more than a fun time. And then look at Rahab. Look at Rahab. You know, the prostitute. She was a prostitute for crying out loud. And here's what James says concerning these people of faith. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered what? Righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a, direct, in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And Rahab had a faith. She did. Joshua 2.11 says this, For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. That is a total counterculture declaration. Because all the other peoples around them were pagan worshipers, sacrificing their children and demon worshipers. And for Rahab to make this statement, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. She demonstrated her faith. And it was more than just a fun time. For crying out loud, the entire city was being destroyed. Every last person was being killed except for Rahab and everyone who was in that household. And she hung that scarlet rope outside of her windows and Joshua told the soldiers, don't touch a finger on anyone who's in that house. They protected us. They've kept us. We're going to protect them as well. So Rahab had a faith. And it was more than just a good time. Everyone was being killed. It was more than just mental ascent. It was more than just talking the talk. She did something. And she hid the spies. And God says, awesome job, Rahab. I'm going to take care of you. So let's close this out. Let's stand together here this morning. <clears throat> Let me throw some things out to you. What are some, what are some actions that we can deliberately put into motion? You know, it's been said of Christians, they're, they're goody-goody two-shoes. Well, that's okay. You know, Jesus, it was said of Jesus by Peter at the house of Cornelius, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And Peter said Jesus was a do-gooder. He was. He was a do-gooder. He did good deeds. The old song, they will know we are Christians by our love. Well, that's, how is that love going to be demonstrated? It has to be demonstrated with actions. So let me just throw some things out to you, how we can deliberately set into motion. This isn't any kind of definitive list. And again, I commend each and every one of you who are actively endeavoring to show 
our Christianity. I don't ever go to a store just simply. Now, I go to stores to conquer. <laughs> I don't go to shop. Oh. And my wife hates shopping even more than I do, believe it or not. You know, I know that I actually buy a lot of my wife's clothes. I buy all of my own, 110% of my own. 100, and I buy a lot of Pastor Kim's clothes too. She hates shopping. And I'll bring things home or I'll, I'll drag her and I'll say, no, you look good in that and that and that. Stay away from that, that and that. No. <laughs> all right? So, but I never go to stores, but what I have the intention, Father, I want to be a blessing to someone. I want to be encouragement to someone. I want to help someone. Let me just throw out some things, you know, just, just, you know, ways we can deliberately set into motion to demonstrate our faith. All right? Here's one. How about sponsoring a BCS student, a Bethel Christian School student? Assist a homeless person. You know, buy them some shoes. Buy them a jacket. Give them your jacket. Both Pastor Kim and I have literally taken off our jackets, our winter jackets, and given them to, to homeless people in the winter on more than one occasion. You know, they, they don't have anything on them. They don't have anything on them. Help a homeless person. Serve at a food pantry for the Thanksgiving meal that's coming up. Maybe pay for a one or two night overnight stay for someone that you think they probably, they probably could be blessed by that. I'll get them a hotel room for a couple of nights. Why don't you become a big brother or a big sister? Kids in the foster system or kids that are just struggling. Learn, learn Spanish. Now here, here's a challenge. Learn Spanish so that you can talk with all the Latinos that are in, a, in the city currently. We've had a huge influx of Latinos in the last several years. How about a, working at a Habitat for Humanity home? You can sling a hammer or a tape measure or a screw gun, you know? How about pay for someone's gas fill up? Okay, pull up and you just tap the card. You don't even have to insert cards now, you just tap your card. That's what would be a blessing to you. And then you give them a Bethel card too. You know, just these, these are just some some thoughts I had as I wrapped up this message. I don't think I have to re-preach this message to get James's point across. Being a believer, a follower of Jesus, wonderful. Praise the Lord. But James says we have to have works to accompany our faith. And he says if we don't, it's not going to last. You're not going to be a servant. And it's going to be proof phony. So Holy Spirit, I want to pray as we close here. And we love to greet you at the door if at all possible. Give kids their fruit snacks. <laughs> Holy Spirit, I thank you for each person that's here today. Thank you for each person that's watching by live stream. And they've tuned in today. And, and I believe you're dealing with us. <laughs> Because you're dealing with me. You're dealing with me. You're probably dealing with other people as well. I first want to thank you for those who really demonstrated their faith by how they ministered into my life, how they served me, how they loved me. How they embraced me when I was so far from you. And they showed their Christianity to me by what they did. And so, Holy Spirit, we want to we wanna not only pay this back, but pay it forward as well. And I pray that you will inspire each one of us, each one of us who love you and love you with our whole hearts. It's more than just talking the talk. We really do. That you will inspire us to good deeds. Show us as to what we can do this week. Maybe it's in our families. Maybe it's in our place of work. Maybe it's out and about in the, in the community. Um, help us, Holy Spirit, to show our real faith, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Darling, if you'll come and close, and, and I'm going to embarrass Fern. Where's Fern? 
I'm going to embarrass Fern. You know, Fern lives this out. She routinely brings people, strangers, to doctor's appointments. She picks them up, drops them off, picks them up, brings them home. Strangers, not, not just Bethel people. Strangers. That's, that's showing. Yes, it is. That's showing the faith. And I just thought of that as, as, we, were, as we were praying. And, it, and so again, this week, let's, I'm not, I, I don't want to add an 11th commandment, but let's show our faith this week. And you know, there's a funny byproduct out of that. It's just really silly. It's called joy. Yeah, that's really true. Yeah. 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 Thank you, thank you, God, for a preacher that tells us the truth that breaks your word and feeds us. And we just appreciate his ministry to us. Bless him today in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Amen. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love to greet you at the door, too, please. <laughs>